Last week we asked the question, if he is God, why doesn't Jesus just fix everything? And we looked at the temptations, and we, we, we looked at the way of religion in this world, where we look at, at someone who is being, at least to our eyes, successful or powerful or wealthy, and in a sense they become this God. And we even looked at this guy in India who, with the, with the Trump visit, was, was, had made a statue to Donald Trump and was worshiping him and calling him God. And I don't think I heard that he ever got an audience with his God, but, well, you know, may have to wait a few more years. And we see how all three of these things are often get bound up, the personal and the religious and the political. Why won't God help us out of our scrapes? Why won't God vindicate our religious allegiance and, and, and help us to, to be seen as right as opposed to the others? Why won't, why won't God pick up the sword and bring justice to the world in the ways that we expect? Now, what we've seen in the history of Israel is that Israel has a very determined faith. <coughs> Problem is now when you cough, everybody, you know, runs for the hills. <coughs> Sometimes if you've been talking all morning, throat gets a little dry. Israel's faith survived and was purified by the Babylonian exile. And they were awaiting the restoration of God's kingdom through Israel. And God would express his approval of his people through their success, their historical, political success. And if you read the Old Testament prophets, there's all this imagery of Israel being supreme among the nations and Israel dominating their neighbors and people living long lives and prosperity and health and all the kinds of things that you'll hear promised on from a political platform today. But that hadn't arrived in the first century. And so many, of, many in the Jewish nation were split on exactly how God would bring this and how they would participate in God bringing this promised kingdom. The zealots used the sword um, to free God's people and to purify their promised land. The only good Roman was a dead Roman. The Essenes went out into the desert and they prayed in the desert for God to destroy the infidels and all of those and all of their 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 Jewish fellow countrymen who were collaborating and intermingling with the Romans. They went out into the desert to be pure and live live pure lives and wait for God to to send a plague or something and just wipe them out. And then of course there were the cultural elites that said, "Well, you know, the world seems to be going the Roman way and the Greek way, and we should go along with the Romans and the Greeks and all the technology and the wonderful things that they're bringing into the world. And then there were the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were sort of moderates. They wanted to be in the world, but not of the world. And so they fought kind of a cultural resistance movement to the Romans. If we keep the laws of the covenant, if we keep the dietary law codes, and we keep the Sabbath, and keep ourselves unpolluted from the world, then God will recognize our commitment to him and vindicate our struggle and bring his kingdom, hopefully by sending a Messiah who will kick out the Romans and through his political leadership will raise us up to the supreme place. And Pharisees had been praying for this and struggling with this and trying to keep those people who were sort of on the bubble from keep them doing the right thing and shunning the people who were doing the wrong thing. Resist by policing obedience and compliance among the people. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he certainly can't be a zealot because he's not raising an army and knifing Roman soldiers. He's not an Essene, although he would go into the desert and pray, he didn't live in the desert. He worked amongst the people and lived in the towns. He wasn't a cultural elite who were 
going along with the Roman and the Greek ways. He observed the, the, he observed the law as a good Jewish, um, a good believer in God as a Jew. And so the Pharisees see Jesus and think all of that power he's demonstrating, the popularity he's exhibiting. What if Jesus would become a Pharisee and use that power? Jesus maybe could be our ticket up and out of here. So, when Jesus was in Jerusalem, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was a kingmaker. And maybe Jesus, a conversation, this could work. So he comes to Jesus at night. Better not risk too much reputation. Let's keep it under wraps. You have to know right now in the Democratic Party that Bernie and Biden are talking to the little kingmakers in different states, getting coalitions, finding endorsements. This is how you make your way up to the top. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So he comes at night. It's reputational, but it's also symbolic. What are his goals? What does he want from Jesus? What kinds of conversation would he like to have with Jesus? Maybe if Jesus were amenable, Nicodemus could say, Jesus, let's be reasonable. I'll help you. You say a few good things about the Pharisees. Encourage the people to keep the Sabbath, keep the dietary laws, stay away from sinners. With a united front together, we can take this thing. Will Jesus do it? Will Jesus be receptive? Isn't Jesus nice? Isn't that how he's supposed to be? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born. And right there we have a problem. Because the Greek word is ambiguous. And the Gospel of John loves playing word games with these words. Because Jesus is going to mean one thing, and Nicodemus is going to mean the other. Jesus says, you can't even see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus, the thing that you're striving to arrange politically. You can't even see it unless you are born from above. But they can also mean born again, because that's how that Greek word is. Nicodemus says, how can anybody be born when they are old? Nicodemus asks, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus, this is supposed to be a nice political sit down where you and I are going to have a conversation and we're going to see what the Jesus agenda is and the Pharisee agenda and we'll see where they overlap. You can't be part of the Zealots. You can't be part of the Essenes. You're not, you're not a Roman sympathizer. We know all this about you. Together, Jesus, the power of the Pharisees and Jesus movement can come together and we can do great things. Jesus, and then you say, I can't even see the kingdom of God unless I'm born again? This is crazy talk. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, the second time in your old Bibles it said, verily, verily I say unto you. Jesus will use this phrase three times in this little discourse. It's for emphasis. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Spirit comes from above. Water comes from above. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born from above. 
The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now again, bear in mind, what is Nicodemus' goal? He wants to establish a coalition. He wants to see a partnership. He wants to have a united front. And bit by bit by bit, the towns will flip. And then one way or another, a leader will arise. And if someone has the power of Jesus, Roman troops shouldn't be a problem. And, and bit by bit, God's kingdom will come. And Jesus doesn't seem to want to play political ball. Jesus, Nicodemus again asks, how can this be? You're talking crazy to me, Jesus. Jesus responds, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? So not only is Jesus not playing ball politically with Nicodemus, now he insults him. Very truly, I tell you, third time, we speak of what we know. Who's we? Nicodemus starts this conversation saying, we know you are from God. Well, Nicodemus, if you really believe that, you'd probably be listening more than debating. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people, where's, where's Ross Perot? Anybody remember Ross Perot? You people, do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. See, here's the thing. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he's going to maybe strike a bargain and he says, well, you've come from God. And here Jesus basically says, you have no idea how much I've come from God. And you come to me in order to strike a little political deal? And then Jesus uses this phrase again, the Son of Man from Daniel 7. And remember, in Daniel 7, the Son of Man figure is, is this imperial figure that inherits a kingdom of the world. And Jesus uses that about himself here. So, so Nicodemus, Nicodemus is a leader, and so he understands the reference, and he understands how this plays out. But Nicodemus doesn't act like he's talking to the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. And right now it starts to get weird. Because again, Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days sets up the throne, and these sea monsters, which represent the empires, the Roman problem, are put down, and coming with the clouds of heaven is the Son of Man, and He is given an eternal kingdom. Nowhere in that story does the Son of Man lose, nor could lose. And so right away, Jesus is not only not playing political ball with Nicodemus, being a bit insulting that, Nicodemus, you should know all this, and now basically is saying, the Son of Man figure has a story you can't understand. This passage is very famous, and almost everyone skips over the strangest part of the passage, which is a reference to the book of Numbers and another strange story. And it's very much a story of why doesn't God fix it now? So the children of Israel are traveling, and they travel from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea, and they're going around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God and against Moses, and they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Oh, you like slavery so much? There is no bread, there is no water, we detest this miserable food. Why doesn't God fix the problem? <coughs> then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit people, and many Israelites died. 
Now, nowhere when I listened to this story did anyone pause and ask the question, how are venomous snakes the answer to bad food and water? But they say, Lord, we're sick of this. We want better food. We need water. And God sends snakes. And we're like, what's with that? But it continues. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed, Moses prayed for the people. And what do you think Moses prayed for? Okay, Lord, they're really sorry. Take away the snakes. So the answer to the prayer should be, because God listens to Moses, that the snakes go away. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on the pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. But pay attention. How is this an answer to Moses' prayer? We don't like the food in the water. Okay, here, have some poisonous snakes. Ah, take away the poisonous snakes. Here, look at this pole. So when you get bit, you don't die. This is a crazy story. And I learned this story as a kid, and nowhere did anyone ever say, what's going on with this story? And this is the story Jesus points out to Nicodemus before Jesus is about to give the Bible verse that gets propped up at stadiums. It's a tremendously strange story, and why does Jesus bring it up here? The snakes don't go away. The people still got bit. The people still got sick. They forgot about the food and water. It's like saying, oh, pastor, I've got a headache. It's always stop on your foot. You say, ow! You say, forgot your headache, didn't you? <laughs> well, yeah. okay, pastor. Not much help. Those who looked on the bronze snake lived. Now let's read the rest. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. And when we hear that, we usually think, well, life after death or something like that. But that strange little word, eternal life, in English really means life of the age, which we don't understand, because the Bible tells time in two ages. There's the present evil age of decay where we all live, and things are uncertain, and plagues come up, and, and life is, and 24-year-olds get paralyzed. That's the age of decay. And then there's the age to come. And that stuff doesn't happen in the age to come. <coughs> That's a different, not a different length of life, but a different kind of life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's what happened with the snake bite victims, right? They wouldn't perish. But have the life of the age to come. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Very famous passage. We always forget about the snakes. There's a strange connection here because in some ways Jesus is just like the snake. Nicodemus is here saying, we got problems with Greeks and Romans and wobbly people. Lord, we want you to send a remedy to the Greeks and Romans and wobbly people. And what does God send? Jesus. Oh, Jesus is supposed to help get rid of... No, Jesus doesn't resolve any of these problems for them. Notice, he's sort of like the snake because... Pretty quickly, the religious leaders are going to say, we had a problem with the Romans, now we got a problem with Jesus. We can't kill the Romans, so let's kill Jesus. That's what they do. Jesus is sort of like the serpents. How is Jesus an answer to prayer? Nicodemus might have asked. Jesus is like the serpent sent to the people complaining about food and water. Israel's heart continues to be unchanged from the desert wanderings. Israel's leader, Nicodemus, needs new eyes and a new way 
Something from above in order to see or enter the kingdom. Israel's leaders, remember what time of day he came at night? Live in darkness. Well, what is this believing thing? How much did belief did it require to look at the bronze serpents and avoid the perishing? So you think about some guy sitting in his hut. He just got bit by the snake. He said he was grumbling about the food and the water. His wife says, hey, they got the bronze serpent. Go look at it. I'm not going to look at that stinking serpent. I complained about the water and the food and God sent snakes and I got bit. So I'm going to stay here in my hut. I'm not looking at that stinking bronze serpent. What's his wife going to say? Die then. <laughs> Die then. <laughs> Your own stubbornness is going to get you killed. Go to the serpent. Look at the bronze serpent. What do you got to lose? <clears throat> Notice seeing, looking, light, and darkness. All the themes of this passage. The desert. They're in the desert. Nicodemus is living in the desert of the Roman occupation. Eternal life, life of the age to come, already stand condemned. You already got bit by the snake. Go look upon the serpent. How much belief do you need? Is it the power of your belief that saves you? Or is it God through the snake lifted up? Nicodemus hopes to recruit Jesus to achieve his food and water upgrades. Jesus' obstinance to resist recruitment is akin to the snake threat. Why doesn't God just resolve the problems Nicodemus sees as the problem? Nicodemus says, life would be great if it weren't for the Romans and the Greeks. No, it wouldn't. The Persians were before that. The Babylonians were before that, and you had problems even before that. Maybe what we think are our problems aren't really what needs addressing. Maybe there's something else wrong. So, how many of you got bit by a snake this morning? Nobody? You, you, got, you got snake bit? Nobody got snake bit this morning. We had food, we had water. I guess we don't have any problems, right? No prayer requests, no, no, everything's great. We have food, we have water, and no biting snakes. Are we more satisfied or obedient? Were those really their problems? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. But we have a Jesus problem. We'll kill him. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Doesn't mean you're not snake bit. Doesn't mean the food and the water are good. Doesn't mean any of those problems are going away. But something else changes that begins to change everything else. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is the serpent that distracts the people from what they thought was their problem. The son of man, the rescue hero emperor, rescue hero emperor is raised up on a pole to be seen. What do they see when they raise him up? They see themselves. The problem's not the Romans. The problem's not the Greeks. The problem is themselves. They need a new heart. That they may see that they are perishing, not because of what they imagine, And looking on him and seeing him born from above like water and spirit, they begin to change. 
What is the food and water distraction in your life? What is your real problem? That's a hard thing. It's been so interesting working with the people, some of whom I met at the meetups, watching people begin to come to terms with different answers to their life. Well, the problem is my job. The problem is my spouse. The problem is this illness. The problem is this relationship. The problem is lack of money or lack of health or lack of this or lack of that. Is that really the problem? Is the real Jesus, not a nice little paper doll Jesus, a serpent to you in his refusal to fix what you need or want fixed? That stubborn Jesus, so stubborn. Why won't he resolve my problems the way I want him to? Will you bother even to look at him raised up just for the chance that you might not perish? Let's pray. Lord, we know that Nicodemus came around because Nicodemus looked at Jesus up on that cross and went and asked for the body. Lord, we don't know how we change. We don't know why we change. We spend so much time worrying about things that are incidental, distracted by things that are important but not essential. And at some point you break through. And we begin to realize that, as is so often the case, the things that we thought were problems were actually messengers from you to shake us out, to shake us out of our self-sufficiency and our, and our self-righteousness and our self-deceit and have us see you for the first time to come to that Son of Man lifted up and to recognize that our new life, our new birth, comes from above. So Lord, work in our hearts, change our assumptions, help us to begin to see with new eyes given by you. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand?